Well, good morning. How are you today? Um, I mentioned last week, just to remind you though, uh, we are changing the time of this service uh, to 9.15. And the reason we're doing that is, uh, there it is, uh, the reason, well, uh, this is wrong. So ignore that. Okay, ignore the, there it is. Oh, okay, it was last week's slide. They, so 9.15, the reason is we just don't need as much time when we were trying to figure out how, you know, to clean the building. And, you know, no, we had never done it before. We had no idea. So we've, since that point, we realized we can clean the building thoroughly and we don't need that much time. Also, it's a long time for people that are, that are serving one and, and, then, and then attending one. They have to wait that extended period of time. So we, we, we think this is going to be a good time for us, at least till the end of the year. And then we'll kind of evaluate. Hopefully, you know, maybe there'll be a vaccine by then and things will start changing. But uh, so that's where we're at. So just remember, of course, it applies to this service more than anybody. So I wanted to remind you, okay, 915. If you come early, no problemo, but uh, that's when we're going to start. All right, well, we are in a series that uh, we're doing on prayer. Prayer is so important whenever you're in life, but certainly whenever you're in a difficult situation, when you're facing some major obstacles, our country is, the world is, with the pandemic, uh, there's a lot going on of unrest in our country, we have politics going on, there's so many things going on, and then that's, that's the world, then we have our world, many of us are, have our own challenges, and we need to go to God, that becomes our lifeline, and uh, we want to learn about prayer, that's why we're spending so much time on it. Now, if you wanted to learn something, you go to an expert, right? I mean, if you want to learn more about the coronavirus, you might like watch some of the, the things that Tony Fauci's saying and Deborah Burks. If you want to learn more about like el electro vehicles, electric vehicles, then maybe, you know, see what Elon Musk is doing. He seems to be doing pretty well. If you want to do an e-commerce business, uh, it seems like Jeff Bezos has something going on, you know, he's a time, you know, man of the year in 1999, and he seems to, he's done pretty well in the last 21 years since then as well. So there's people we can go to because they're experts in the area, they can certainly teach us a lot. When it comes to prayer, Jesus is the expert. I mean, he, there is nobody who understood prayer better than Jesus, nobody who was more passionate, who had more faith for prayer, and he understood it and wants to teach and communicate what he knows about prayer. One time the disciples kind of stumbled upon Jesus when he was kneeling in prayer and they watched how he prayed. And so when he was done, he got up and came back and joined them. And, he, and they said, they asked him a question. They said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray just by seeing how he prayed. Now, Jesus could do a lot of amazing things. He I mean, he gave the greatest sermon ever given on the Sermon on the Mount. He gave other great sermons. They never said once, oh, teach us to preach. Wow, you're an amazing preacher, Jesus. Teach us to preach. And then he did a ton of miracles. And only once did they say, Lord, show us how to do miracles like that. And his answer was, it's through prayer. It's through prayer. So no wonder the disciples were interested in learning about prayer and why it's the lifeblood of all what Jesus did. Everything he did. Now, the problem sometimes with Christianity, the Christianity we, we uh, many of us have, have grown up to know, or maybe you grew up in the church, is we reduce Christianity down to like doctrines and creeds. And if you're like, you know, in cadence with everybody else, you must be doing, that must be Christianity. Or if you're just doing humanitarian kindness to people that are less fortunate to you. And we start to see Christianity in those, ter oh, those terms. But what really is in the backdrop of all that is a spiritual walk. Here's the way the Bible puts it. We walk by faith and not by sight. In other words, not the things we can see. There is a spiritual undercurrent, and you only tap into that. You only understand it and be able to move in that through prayer. You start to connect to the spiritual part, the part where you're, where you're walking not so much by what you see, but what you see spiritually this area of faith. Now, the th one of, probably the number one thing that gets in the way of us connecting into God this way through prayer is busyness. I mean, we get so busy. We're so busy. We fill our schedules up so easily. We're good at that. Now, even with COVID-19 and we had self-quarantine, we had three months of lockdown, you'd think we'd have 
gobs and gobs of time. And, you know, in many, in many people, they did. However, that didn't change the fact that they could fill their schedule with stuff. They still became very, very busy. They just added different things. And whenever we become so busy, we don't have time for prayer. Regardless of whether it's COVID or a, a busy season in our work time or whatever, whenever we neglect God for busyness, there's a word for that. It's called worldliness. That's what the, the Bible word is, when we become worldly. In other words, we're living like the world. And in fact, the more stress, the more challenge we're in, that's all the more time we need to connect in with God and not be tied into what the world is. Notice here this verse here. It says, as Christ's soldiers, do not let yourself become tied up in worldly affairs. In other words, we're, we're, we move in the world, we're in the world, but the Bible says you're not of the world. That you've got to get your marching orders, your assignment from God, not just for life, but each day. And so you've got to know, God, what am I supposed to do? Almost like a soldier, you know, just, okay, what are my orders today, sir? What am I supposed to be doing? How are you going to know what to do? How, how's God going to reveal anything to you if you don't pause and listen for his still, small voice? Just Not just giving him a little leftover time, but quality time. God, I want you to speak to me. It says, don't get tied up in that. Then you can't satisfy the one who enlisted you into his army. So worldliness is getting caught up with society's agenda to the neglect of our walk with God. And that's a problem. So Jesus talks about having a, 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 a good quality, intimate relationship with God. And he unpacks that for the disciples. We're going to look at that. But right, right before that, I want to just bring a couple danger zones to what could get in the way of your prayer life. One is just being in the marketplace. I mean, in the marketplace, time is money. And the busier you are, the earlier you get up in the morning, the later you work. I mean, you get rewarded for that. You work real hard. And there's generally compensation that comes with that. There's promotions. There's uh, just makes you feel better. I mean, your adrenaline gets fired up because you're going to be making sales and, and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and the excitement of the hunt and all those things. And it can be exciting, certainly. But that can also quash our opportunity to spend time with the Lord because we get caught up in the marketplace and the world and all those exciting things and, and wanting what the world offers us. And those things aren't wrong in, of themselves unless they cause us to neglect our walk with God. Second thing is just when you have small kids. Now, that's a season in life, right? I mean, we, my kids are growing up, but at one point I had three little guys running around all the time, always, you know, running at 10,000 RPMs and you know, they get up, they wake you up, you know, you don't need an alarm clock in those days, you know, it just, they wake you up, you're, and they're running all the way, they run you ragging until, the, until night, you know. Now, many, that, many times this is, you know, women of small children, but in this day and age, a lot of times it's guys as well. And you get to the end of the day after wiping down the walls from the crayon marks that are on there and the mud that is on the floor, and you hit the sack, and you're exhausted, and for us, it seemed like it was a regular time that our, we would get up in the night as well. One of the kids had a nightmare, or they got, you know, sick, or something went on. And so Sharon and I, it was a running joke in our home that we would, like, just do paper, rock, scissors to see who was going to get up with the kids. When one, we just knew. Somebody's going to get up. Who's getting up? We do paper, rock, scissors, and, and uh, you know. So, I mean, I was trying to do my part. My, here, here's the thing. Sharon... Sharon, like, her, her prayers really get answered. And so my only rule when we play rape, paper, rock, scissors, I'd say, you can't pray because that's unfair. You know, because I just saw the trend. She would pray, I would lose. So that was my rule. And then single working parents, very tough, wearing multiple hats, all of the juggling responsibilities, the emotional drain, the spiritual drain, so much that goes into that. And with these things, these aren't the only things, but these are danger th things as well as others, but they just cause us to miss those moments where we just create a place where we can dial into God and hear from the Lord. This is really important. And so once we do that, if we avoid the danger zones, we create a pocket where God can speak to us. Here's some things that Jesus teaches us 
that can help us in our prayer. Number one is to pray secretly. To pray secretly. In other words, have an inner room, a secret place. A place, I mean, a secret is when other people don't know, right? It's, it's, it's something you know, other people don't know. That's really what he's getting at here. This is a place between you and God, and you, you don't want other people like invading that space. And when you pray, you shall not, like, not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues or in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you, they've had their reward. In other words, there's, uh, they were like on the opposite end of that. Not only was it not secret, it was like showy. You know? and, and we can do that, right? I mean, that can, we can fall into that. We would, be, we would say something like, you know, oh yeah, I pray in social gatherings and at mealtimes. You know, and, 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 you know, when people are around, when it's the right time, you know, I mean, this is kind of like the time we're supposed to be praying, and it's, and it's just kind of, you lob a, you know, some kind of phrase out there. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut your door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. This is the key to prayer. He says, you need to find a place that is secret. It's between you and God. It's between you and God. It can be any place. It's not anything. For Jesus, it was the Garden of Gethsemane. It was just a garden where there was some olive trees. That's it. And there was a couple rocks around and maybe a boulder here or there. I mean, it's, it's, doesn't, it's not the place that makes it special. It's, it's what happens at the place. Now, Jesus, I think, talks about being a secret place for two reasons. Number one is a practical reason. The practical reason of it being secret, other people aren't part of it, is is that you have eliminated distractions. If you're like me, you know that distractions is enemy number one when it comes to prayer. I mean, it seems like anything can draw my attention away when I'm trying to pray. It doesn't take a lot. I mean, it doesn't take explosions and earthquakes. I mean, somebody walking by, the, somebody talking on the TV. On the, I mean, the smallest things, just a bird flying by. Well, look at that bird. You don't see those very often. I mean, just, uh, I'm just off and running. And so a secret place eliminates the distractions. It's, the, it, it's just you're dialed in. You're dialed in. God's speaking to you in that place. Sharon and I started this church set 27 years ago. We started in our home, went to uh, a couple schools, went to the Cinema Cafe there down in uh, Pembroke for three and a half years before we ended up here. And when we were in that uh, Cinema Cafe, we, Sharon and I would like to find a place to pray before service so we could pray for you, uh, pray for uh, some of the things that God was doing in the church, pray for the lost, the people that were coming in. And we would, the place that we had found, because it wasn't that big and everybody was, everything else was being used really, was this little broom closet. And the little, we just shut ourselves in. In there, it was real small. Lighting was poor. There was some really intense smells of vinegar and ammonia and bleach. Hopefully those don't mix, right? And just, and just, but there was like a floor drain and they were pouring, you know, they were like, do, you know, get all the grease and pour it. I mean, there's, it was pretty, pretty raunchy. But it was special to us because God spoke to us in that place. That was our secret place. It wasn't the only secret place, but for that, for that place and, and, and in that season, that was our secret place. And so God can use any place. That's where you connect with God. And then there's just really a spiritual reason because God... Co- it's in that place where you just, uh, it, it almost has like, uh, that's where you and God meet. You know, married couples sometimes have a place where they, they love to go, and, and, or just couples, I guess you don't have to be married, right? Just couples where they go and they love a particular restaurant, even maybe a particular table. That's where they connect. They have good memories there. And families will go to a vacation spot year after year. Because that's almost like a second home. They love it. They connect there. That's their place to connect. When this is what's going on, when we have a place, this becomes our place of like the Garden of Gethsemane was for Jesus, a place where we connect with God. We build memories. We build kind of, we get there and we just, this is it. This is where God, God and I meet. This is the place where we connect. And it can be 
a real powerful thing. Number two is to play sincere, sincerely. Sincerity is an important part, not just throwing out phrases. Some people, they collect enough jargon, and they string together, you know, these enough religious phrases, and they think that's prayer. And Jesus says, no, just, if, there's, if your mind is not engaged, it does not, and you're throwing, you know, these phrases out, it doesn't mean heaven is listening. Notice, it says, and when he, Jesus says, and when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things you have need of before you ask him. So having prayers that have meaning for you, you're thinking about them. They, they, they're draw, drawn from inside your soul, in your heart, not just throwing phrases out. I mean, I think we all fall into that. Sharon and I certainly do. We'll sometimes be sitting down, you know, at a fast food restaurant or some other restaurant. We'll have ordered something that is not good for us. You know, I mean, it's just like, you know, like an onion blossom, deep fat fried. And, you know, the grease is glistening and the, and the, and the salt is shimmering. And we've got a big sugary drink to slosh it all down with. And then we pray over it, you know. Lord, thank you for this food. Uh, bless it to the nourishment of our body so we can do your will. What kind of prayer is that? You know, his will is probably to give it to a dog. Actually, he likes dogs. He'd probably say, just throw that out. You know, that's my will. But, we, you know, and I'm not saying don't eat that. I'm saying, well, maybe don't eat that. But I'm saying, it's think about the prayer, though. Or is that, that's just like, that's like a, the fifth grader who goes and takes a geography test and, and then realizes he got something wrong and then prays afterwards, God, could you please make Roanoke the capital of Virginia? I mean, God doesn't really answer those kinds of prayers, right? And so praying that fast food magically becomes nutritious to our body, you know, what kind of prayer is that? And so we need to be thinking about our prayers, prayers that come from our heart, from our soul. It says, pour out your hearts in his presence. You go to God and you just open up. Say, God, this is what's going on in my life. This is what's really happening. I mean, we do that with good relationships, right? People that you're close with, that's, the, that's part of the reason you're close is because you can, you can be yourself. You can open up. And when Jesus says pray secretly, part of what he's saying is, is hey, when, when other people are not around, we can be more open. We can be more our, of ourselves, right? When, when we know people are watching, we're, we're more cognizant of our behavior. But when we're in our secret place, we're alone with God, we can pour out our hearts. We can open up. We can prostrate ourselves if we need to be. Become prone. And it's interesting, you know, th th that word prone is thrown out a lot. You know, I mean, because in, in, in the COVID days, if now they've learned that if you're in the hospital, if they bring you in, they put you on oxygen, they put you on the ventilator, whatever, they put you prone, face down, because you're more likely to be healed in that position. That's actually true spiritually, too. You know, God does something. That you see it over and over that when we get prone, when we're face down before God, God does something. God does something in our lives. And really, what it's, it's not just the position. It's what the position means. It means I'm pouring my heart out. You know how troubled I am. You have kept a record of my tears, the psalmist says. They actually had a tradition in, in Judaism where they would collect their tears when they would cry a lot, when they would go through a significant amount of pain. They had a tear jar. They find them all over in, in uh, biblical archaeology over in Israel. They find these tear jars where people would collect their tears, and then as they would pray, those tears symbolized something that was going on in their heart, in their, in their life. In Luke chapter 7, this woman, Mary, is deeply distressed and troubled, so much so she can't even say anything. She can't even say any words to Jesus. She just goes before Jesus and cries. She just weeps and weeps all over uh, his feet. And over the years, that has been a great demonstration among Christianity saying that's what sincerity looks like. When you're really open with God, when you're not trying to sugarcoat it and and, uh, and make it look better than it is. You're just, hey, this is really where I'm at, God. And when we do that, God has the ability to inject hope and peace into our lives. 
and joy. He says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust him. As you put your trust in him, you go to him that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God does this beautiful exchange where he gives, he takes, he starts to take away some of that stuff and in its place puts a joy and a hope and a peace that we wouldn't have had any other way. The key relationship, or excuse me, the key ingredient to any healthy relationship is sincerity. It's sincerity to really be open, transparent, and you fight for that. If you talk to married couples that have been married for a long time, decades, you'll find many, 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 maybe most, that you start talking about romance and it's a distant memory. You talk about, you know, a fire in their relationship. For many of them, it's just fallen into cohabitation. I mean, they, they pass each other in the driveway. They pass each other in the hallway. They might eat together, probably in front of the TV. But there's little, little intimacy and closeness in that relationship. It's just disintegrated down to cohabitation. This is the, the plight of many, many relationships. There's some people, though, some couples from time to time, that declare war on cohabitation. They say, I don't want that in my relationship. And so they start to fight for that. And they say, we're going to really open up. We're going to find places in our lives where we can laugh together, we can cry together, we can pray together, we can connect. We, we're we're going to fight for that, and we're going to need some kind of vehicle. It just doesn't happen on its own. And they say, okay, we're going to have... Uh, a date night. And here it is on the calendar. We're going to walk on the beach. We're going to do something. We're going to create a place, some kind of pl- you know, vehicle or place where we can help foster that relationship. And this is what Jesus is getting at when he's talking about a place where you go and you pray secretly and sincerely. You're fighting for that relationship because it is important. It's not okay just to put on uh, this, you know, title of Christian and then just try to just do the rest of the life on your own. No, you're going to fight for a close relationship with God. And this is what he's getting at. Pray secretly, pray sincerely, and pray specifically. Pray specifically. And when the disciples asked him, Lord, teach us to pray, he gave them specific things to pray. Now, it's more of a model, and we talked about this in a couple of the earlier uh, sessions of this series where, you know, a, a kind of having a model, I gave you your hand as an option to kind of walk through it, and it's real similar to this. But here's what Jesus says, and then we'll break it into the specifics. He says, this then is how you should pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also forgive our debtors. Then he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So these, these are six specific ways that we can pray when we go to God. First of all, specifically recognize who God is in your life. That you give him honor. God, you are the source of everything. You can, you, you'll make Sure, I'm taken care of. And th- that's a trust statement. And, that, and this enemy is always trying to get you to doubt that, that God doesn't really love you. That's why Jesus talked quite a bit about that, actually, especially in the Sermon on the Mount. He talked about this whole idea that God really doesn't care for you, and that that's how the Gentiles think. That's how the heathen think. He goes, no, if you're a follower of Christ, one of the first things that means is you buy into the idea that God cares for you, and God's going to watch over you and provide for you. So you recognize that, God, you are my healer. You are the person who's my source of all things, and I can trust you in that. So this is the first thing we do is give God honor. Our Father in heaven, and in the Good News translation, it says, may your name be honored, because that's what it's talking about, that we honor God. Secondly is your worries. We all have worries. And, and Jesus has the way of always kind of going to sometimes the, the most basic, the smallest thing maybe, and here he talks about just, hey, just daily bread. Because sometimes we, we, we worry about these big things. And whether it's big or small, there's no ranking for God. He wants, he wants to meet your needs. He wants to provide blessings in your life. And so our tendency, though, is to worry. Now, our, now here, listen. Sometimes I think as Christ followers, we think worrying is praying. 
I mean, we, we think, well, I'm a Christian, and I'm worrying, and so God knows I'm worrying, and so that must convert to prayer somehow. No, that's not at all what happens. In fact, Jesus specifically teaches against that. He says, when you're a Christian, when you're a Christ follower, and you worry, you're actually walking, you're actually living a life that's more like the heathen, more like the people that don't believe in God. He goes, don't do that. And so if it's big enough to worry about, it's certainly big enough to pray about. So we spend time in prayer instead of worry. In fact, the more time you pray, the, you'll find your worries start to go down. The, you don't, the, you just, they don't have the grip in your life. They don't get you like, the, like they used to. Jesus' promise is, is, he said, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Everything that God has, he says, I'm going to use that to meet your needs. Then God, give God your guilt. Well, many of us have regrets, things in our past, things that hold us back that we need freedom from if we're going to really serve God and joy. In two weeks, we're going to do a four-week series on living a, a no-regret life, a no-regret life for, for the month of August. We're going to look at that because this is an area where so many people uh, get, get uh, snagged. They get snared in this area of their past and the guilt and then the condemnation that comes, and they don't know how to get rid of that. And they just let that stuff harbor and fester in their, in their minds and in their hearts. Forgive us our debts, Jesus says. And then give God your hurts. Now, people hurt us because we live with people. We interact with them. And so most of life's hurts really are from people. There's other hurts, certainly, but a lot of other hurts. And so Jesus is saying, hey, we need to make sure and be able to forgive other people because that's the vehicle that we receive forgiveness and healing. Forgive us our sins as we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And then lastly, uh, I put them together, fears and temptations, both. We all have those. We have, fe we have fears of the future, fears that maybe a loved one would die, fears that uh, you know, our financial situation will collapse, that we won't have a job, that we could lose a job, that we won't get the promotion, that we won't get the, you know, the baby, that I won't get married. I mean, just... There's, there's a many, many fears, and we go to God, and we say, this is really what's happening in my life, when, and the temptations. Some temptations we're able to repel, some we're not. Some get the best of us, and then if we fall to temptation, the evil one's goal is to get you where you're ensnared, where you're, you're locked up, where you are in bondage to him, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. So what's out of control in your life? It's a temptation that you're falling over and over to, and what do you fear the most? This is the question that you go to God with specifically. God, this is what I need your intervention for. This is what I need your help in. Well, I want to pray, and I want to I pray a blessing and a prayer of power and deliverance upon you right now. I, I, have, I, I like Apple products. So I'm, I'm an Apple person. One of the features that Apple has that I like, how many of you ever use, have any kind of Apple device? Eh, some, yeah. I don't know, 40% or something. If you have an Apple device, you probably know about this. It is called AirDrop. You can AirDrop, especially it's a really nice when you have the larger files that are hard to, you know, how am I going to, you don't want to use a thumb drive. And, and so you, it's a feature where you can just AirDrop it. You connect to another uh, another computer. I think I think uh, PC uh, PCs have those as well. It's just it's called something different. In Apple, here it is. There it is. If you now, I'm calling it my prayer drop. So I want a prayer drop, just like it's kind of like through the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and it just invisibly just drops right into your computer, and you can download it. I want a prayer drop, a prayer. But listen, when you see this on your computer pop up for for an airdrop, you have to accept it. I mean, it pops up, makes that noise, and you have to click on it and say, yes, I want that. I want that onto my computer. And so I'm going to prayer drop something, but you have to receive it. You have to say, God, I want that in my life. Okay, so if you would, just bow your heads, whatever you feel comfortable with, close your eyes. You can put your arms kind of out, you know, like you're receiving, whatever you want. But I want to prayer drop a prayer right now into your life. Father, I just lift your name up right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you that you have the power to do the things we talk about. We don't just have to come and discuss how great it was back in the day. Today is the day. And you want to do great things 
right now for us. Lord, we want to tap into the riches of heaven, to the riches of Christ Jesus. We have different needs represented here, different spaces in life, different seasons. You're great enough to meet all of those needs, all of those needs. God, I pray that you would rise up people with authority. Lord, we would understand who we are in Christ. Lord, I pray for every person here, Lord, if, that you drop into their heart that they are a priest and a king of, in, in, in the kingdom of God. They have authority to walk into the throne room of God and boldly ask for things from you. Lord, pray, I pray for unity. Unity within our own homes, unity within our own soul, integrity. Lord, I pray for unity within the body of Christ. Lord, I pray for unity for our country. There's something beautiful that happens about the, when unity takes place. It's a gift from you. Sometimes we think it's our clever thinking and our structures and we just get things right. Unity is a, is a gift from heaven. We recognize that. Lord, we say we need that. We need unity. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with hurt and pain and guilt and regrets. Lord, I pray that you, the God of hope, would put joy and peace in everyone's heart who has allowed, because of life circumstances, that's just kind of torn some of that out of their life. Some of you need to forgive people. That's the vehicle you need to, that's the bridge you need to walk across to get forgiveness. You're holding on to that. Not because they deserve it, because they don't, but because you deserve the healing that comes from forgiveness. You deserve the healing that comes from you forgiving others. We just offer that. God, help me to forgive. Lord, I forgive them. Just kind of declare it. Name the offense, name the person. You know, I've already done that. Do it again. fear the most? What has control over you? God, I pray that you would let your power be unleashed right now in the hearts and the minds of everyone here. Let us walk in the strength of the Lord to encourage one another, to encourage ourselves. God told me yesterday to tell the weekend services, he said, make sure and remind them they need to be positive. Po stay positive. I mean, sometimes we use things around us as, a, as a, an excuse to be negative. Well, look at the way things are today. I have a, a right to be negative. And God says that as children of God, he wants you to shine out in a world of darkness. You are to be positive. And he'll help you. Say, God, help me to be a more positive person each day to walk up, wake up and to look at the world knowing that I've got the greatest future awaiting me in eternity. But also, God, I believe you have a good future awaiting me here on earth. And then would you say, God, help me? Because honestly, some of you, the things we read about with Jesus where he said, hey, you need to have a room that's secret. If you're honest, you know that that's, that's an area you need, you need. You don't have a secret place. 
You don't have a place that's free from distractions, a place where that's where you meet with God, where you can be honest, where you can cry if that's what's needed. You can be prone if that's what's needed. You say, God, help me to have a secret place. Lord, I pray that you open that up. As they walk here from this service, that they wouldn't just forget about it. They would burn in their soul. I need a secret place. A place where I can be sincere. A place where I can be specific. A place where I can come and, 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 and go to God and say, God, I don't want to worry anymore. I want to trust. If you've never put your trust in Jesus, this is the first step. And right now, would you say, God, I want to trust you. Thank you for sending your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me so that I may live and live the life that's full. Fill me up with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, it's, I think prayer is an amazing vehicle to help us to just see the world change around us. So often we feel like victims. What are we going to do? And, and we feel if we don't feel like victims, we feel, you know, useless. There's so much going on and we're one little piece. When we tap into, the, into God, we're more than one little piece. We have the ability to really make change. Uh, we're going to take the offering now. Of course, we don't pass uh, the offering as we have done in the past, but we do have electronic ways where you can give. If you haven't given this week, uh, I'm going to encourage you, would you uh, invest into what we're doing and and helping us to further the kingdom of God and, and the opportunities that COVID is opening up for us and uh, all the disruptions that's happening worldwide. This is an opportunity for the church to shine. And, uh, and certainly we want to be able to do that. We, uh, here's the ways we've provided. And uh, thank you for coming. If you'd like to receive prayer, uh, we will pray for you. We have our masks on. I'll put them on right after, right after I'm done speaking. We'll be up here. You can come up and receive prayer. Stay where you're at. We'll come to you and pray for you. But the Lord bless you. Okay, would you stand? And I'll just dismiss this in prayer. All right. Thank you, Lord. Let us go with the strength of the Lord. Each person here, Lord, that we would walk more securely, more positively. Lord, I pray that you help us to just have an aura that people will sense there's something different with this person and that it just comes out of us and affects the people around us for good. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for coming again. The Lord bless you. Take, uh, see you next week.